So a quick summary of what we have kind of looked at so far. And this session is independent. So if you were sleeping so far, don't worry. You can still take away a few things from this session. But the, the first talk was around basically like two takeaways from the first talk. That there is something called marketplaces. A lot of good businesses are making a lot, shit ton of good money uh, around marketplaces. And it throws up quite a few interesting machine learning challenges uh, in recommendations in a marketplace. And we, we kind of demonstrated one bandit-based model, which was looking at exploration, exploitation in an explainable space. We were working with Spotify homepage, wherein you had these playlists shown as shells, and then you had this like slate level ranking of these cards. And then we showed like explanations usually help. So in, in general, so far, the goal of me talking today was to convince you that when you're thinking about marketplaces, then you need to rethink how you're doing recommendations. Because most of the work around recommendation systems have been around user-centric methods, user engagement, user metrics. And when you, when you start thinking about marketplaces, then you have multi, multiple stakeholders. So in this part of the talk, we're going to talk about what kind of multiple stakeholder models we can investigate and what they might look like. Before we go further, any questions from the previous, any quick questions? So in the first part, we talked about phase one, user-centric Rexes, bandits. In the second part, what we're going to do is we're going to inject one competing objective. And this competing objective would be fairness, which we're going to define later on. We're going to present some initial results, motivate that, oh, there is something there, and we should kind of do some multi-objective work. And in the, th in the second part of this talk, we're going to focus more on the multi-stakeholder models. So, in this talk, uh, we're kind of going beyond user satisfaction. So far, in the first model we presented, we were talking about maximizing user engagement. User engagement was user clicking on a playlist and streaming music. And now we want to go beyond just satisfaction and say that, how can we inject some other business-centric objectives over here? And this work is from the second paper we had earlier this year, which is towards a fair marketplace. So if you've if you doze off in the next 15 minutes, then feel free to go back to this paper and read it. So we're, we're going to work on, when I say going beyond user satisfaction, so what do I mean? So what I mean is like uh, we're, we're going to talk about relevance versus exposure on home. So this is the home page of Spotify. What we do is we show you playlists based on your relevance, that based on your interest, based on this playlist, how relevant it is to you. So so far, we have looked at relevance-specific models. But now we want to care about exposure of artists as well. So if you, if you, care, if you think about these uh, marketplaces, then there's like a, this long tail problem that you have the super popular head, and then you have this long tail of artists and, sup and suppliers which are not exposed equally. Same for search. Like on, on Google, on Bing, a lot of these queries are like Facebook. And uh, a lot of these like Facebook queries are there. Because people want to go to Facebook, so 20, 30% of queries are around that. So head makes a major bulk of uh, the traffic which you surface. So same happens for, let's say, Amazon and Spotify and other e-commerce e or uh, marketplace platforms, that you have a super popular head. Like Ed Sheeran and Lady Gaga, they are like super popular. But someone like, some, someone like Dennis Lloyd, he was unknown like six months ago. So he's like down in the long tail and not getting exposed. So what you want to do is we want to take into account that we want, to expo we want to be fair in terms of representing artists as well. So this is what we are trying to do over here, that care not just about user satisfaction, but also some sort of metric around artist fairness when we are recommending playlists to you. So a common pitfall of user-centric recommendations are that we recommend based on predicted relevance. And that results in superstar economics, like the long tail. Some of these suppliers are super popular, and then there's this long tail with respect to popularity, relevance, and exposure. So we expose some people very heavily. We may not expose a lot of other people that much. So yeah, a number of reasons that might happen. But in general, suppliers would want a fair opportunity to be presented to the users. That if I'm an artist, then I, I don't want uh, me to be not exposed to users because that's unfair to me. So the idea over here is that blindly optimizing for relevance 
without taking into account this sort of fairness estimate might hurt fairness for the artist. And this is true for all suppliers. By supplier, I mean the other side of the marketplace. So we have a marketplace, users are the consumers, suppliers at Spotify are the artists. So blindly optimizing for relevance may not be a good way. So this is a research question which we posed that we want to consider the trade-off between relevance of a recommendation to the user and fairness of the representation to the supplier and measure its impact on satisfaction. So if it's, if it's quite a few words, then take over three words from here. We have the relevance, how relevant it is. We have the fairness, how fair it is to the artist. And is the user happy or not? So what we try to do is we try to propose some recommendation techniques which optimize for relevance, optimize for fairness, and see how the user satisfaction is impacted. So we have to define relevance. So relevance is just some similarity in the embedding space. So you can use any of the fancy deep architectures we discussed previously, learn embeddings, and then computer relevance score. We can define satisfaction using any of the utility methods. We rely on uh, implicit signals like tracks played. If we show you a playlist and did you stream something, or how long did you stream? So we can use some of these to define satisfaction. Interestingly, to define fairness, it's a very, very uh, hard problem. And it's a very philosophical question as well. So we don't attempt to answer that question. So there's a disclaimer here that we're just going to work with our definition of fairness. And we're not saying that this is the right definition or philosophy around fairness to consider. So in general, there have been numerous efforts. Uh, if you haven't, again, the moment I move my mouse, this goes away. So behind this black thing, there is this, yeah, the 21 definitions of fairness is a very nice blog post article if uh, you're interested in this. So basically what, what this tutorial and what this definition gives you is like you can consider fairness in a number of different attributes. You can consider individual fairness, group fairness, and you can consider some mis like generalization, false positive rate, and a, a bunch of other stuff. So there is no one way to define fairness, and it's like a very complicated problem itself. But what we do is we stick with one definition which we proposed back in SIGIR 2015. So the idea is like we define group fairness. So we have this collection of artists, and we divide these artists into popularity groups. That some of these artists are like super popular. So what you can do is you can divide the spectrum of the artists based on their percentiles in the popularity spectrum. So on the long tail, you have certain artists who are like very, very unpopular. I mean, very niche artists, not very much exposed. On the other side, you have the head artists, which are very popular, like Ed Sheeran's and Lady Gaga's of the music industry. So we have these different groups defined. And what we want to say is that we want to come up with a function which says that if you consider artists from different groups, then it's more fair than if you consider artists from just one group. So imagine like if I only show you recommendations from the top, from the most popular artist, then that's unfair in our definition of fairness. And if I show you artists from the entire spectrum of artists, then that's fair. So that's how we have defined this. And basically, what this function does is something similar. So let's say if I have a budget of four, then I have three groups over here. If I pick up all four people from this group, then I get this value, which is under, under root of four, which is two. And instead, if I pick up two people from here, one from here, one from here, then this value is better, is greater. So basically, this function allows you to kind of quantify that if I'm picking things from multiple groups, then it's like a better thing. So you can use this function to quantify your fairness estimate. Now, this is just one definition. And the, the entire framework and the work is amenable to other interpretations and definitions of fairness. Just to mention over here that if you're interested in discussing or talking about fairness, then you should start thinking about like when can we be fair to the artist? If an artist is just launched a new track, he's a new artist, then should he be exposed equally than somebody who has been who has like 15 songs over the last five years? So then do we do we want equal exposure for them or not? So that's an important question. Or if an artist already has 15,000 views on Spotify, there's a new artist coming in, then philosophically, what does fair to each of them look like? So defining fairness is a very challenging problem. And this is something which we are kind of starting to investigate. And it's not just machine learning. It's not at all machine learning. It's most of societal implications as well. Because if you launch in a new market, and if you're not defining fairness correctly, then you might kill the local music culture. 
So it's very important, like I'm stressing, like forget about the mathematics behind the machine learning models. For Spotify, it's very important to get this fairness and this representation right, because I know we are launching in India next year, and if we do not do this correctly, then we might kill Bollywood music, which is like a very bad societal effect we might have. So that's why it's important for these models to be aware of uh, the, the definitions. Even this one function can screw up a lot of non-technical aspects around societal, around music culture as well. So again, a lot of work has to be done on fairness. We're just using one definition. Now, beyond all this, all this uh, seriousness, coming to this relevance versus exposure bit. So if I just create a plot, so I have this relevance defined. So I have a user, I have a playlist. So now I have defined two metrics. One is how relevant is this playlist and how fair is this playlist. So if I plot it, what it shows is that not a lot of highly fair playlists have high relevance because there's a void over here. So that means like you can, if, if a playlist is super relevant, it's not fair. If a playlist is super fair, it's not relevant. So this is the root cause of all the problems over here because had there been a guy over here, then I could always recommend this playlist and do well on both the metrics. I'm fair as well and I'm relevant as well. But this is a problem, it's, it's void over here. So in general, this hints at the fact that a recommendation system optimizing only for relevance may not have a high fairness estimate. So this is a conjecture we pose that Optimizing for relevance without explicitly considering fairness has an adver adverse impact on supplier fairness. And for the sake of time, I'm going to rush through some of these slides now. So in general, if I have these two metrics defined, then what could the different recommendation policies look like? Now, forget the math. It's not very tricky over here. It's just very intuitive. So let's say. I, in the first policy we propose, we only care about relevance. I don't care about fairness at all. So what I do is show me a playlist which is most relevant to me regardless of anything else. That's a simple policy over here. So this function quantifies for this user, for this set, how, uh, how, much, how relevant it is. I can do that for fairness as well. That's the other extreme. On one extreme, I care only for relevance. On the other extreme, I care only for fairness. What I can do is I can do a probabilistic policy that sometimes I care for relevance, sometimes I care for, for fairness. So for each session, I'll flip a coin and either show you relevant songs or show you fair, fair playlist. Or I could be a bit more fancy and say I can trade off. So for each playlist, I can define a score, which is very simple, that I'll do a linear combination of fairness and relevance score and then show it. It's very intuitive, nothing fancy over here. But these are different flavors. You have one extreme only relevant, you, the other extreme is only fair, and then you have things in between. The other thing is, a nice insight is that, in general, when we are talking to product people, then they are very, like, they don't want to show fair content because that would tank the satisfaction, that would tank their metrics. So as product managers, you're very skeptical of showing uh, less relevant content, which, which makes sense. So this is what inspired like a guaranteed relevance policy, that, I have this like optimization metric, which is very simple. It's just one single constraint saying that I'm guaranteeing that the relevance would not go below this threshold beta. So I'm guaranteeing that on a scale of 0 to 1, the worst relevance you could have is 0.8. Now, as long as I ensure this to you, allow me to do anything I want. So this is like a pact you can have with your product teams and say that my recommendation policy would guarantee a minimum level of relevance. Once that guarantee is achieved, then I can be show you as fair content as possible. So this is kind of a, a mixed policy which is okay with like the product managers when you talk with them. In general, so far these policies are user agnostic, and what we next discuss is like how can you kind of uh, leverage user specific traits. So an example over here, which is something which I personally relate to, is that I've been paying for Spotify as a user since 2012. And I've been loyal to Spotify as a user for five years. So no matter how shitty recommendations you show to me, I'm not going to go away. So different users are differently toler like tolerant to the recommendations. Like some users are like diehard fans, so they're not going to go away just because they had like one bad session. But some other users are on the brinks of going to Apple Music. So you, you, you can quantify how tolerant the user is. Some users are inherently more OK. I mean, if you show me other non-related music, then what's the worst you could do to me? I mean, you show me a song which I won't like? I mean, what's the I mean, that's not a very bad thing. So some users are more tolerant to diverse recommendations than the others as well. So what we do is we leverage this insight 
that users have varying sensitivity towards fair content. Some users might be okay with it, some users may get very angry. So if I'm able to capture and quantify that, then I can adjust my recommendation policy and say that, I mean, I'll skip the details, but we can define this fairness affinity that do you get angry if we show you fair content? If you get angry, then that's the case. Like for users who have a negative affinity that they would get angry if we show them fair content, then we only optimize for fair, for relevance. If they are okay, then we optimize for fairness as well. So this is like a user error to policy. Uh, this is a brief summary that you can do just relevance, fairness, you can do some things in between. You can have different versions of the adaptive policy. But philosophically, the idea of adaptive policy says that you take into account the user tolerance when you're recommending uh, playlists as such. So the question then becomes like, okay, all this is fair. I mean, when you show these recommendations, then you're either relevant or fair, but how do the users behave? So that's the question we wanted to ask. Like, so we are doing this analysis on user satisfaction estimate. So the first result we got was that only optimizing for fairness hurt satisfaction. So we observed like a 35% decline in satisfaction if we only show you content which is fair without taking into account relevance. So in general, this is the best plot I would have hoped for, that if you go from this extreme from only fair to only relevant, then you get this nice curve which says that the more right you go, the more satisfaction increases. So users are happy when they are shown relevant content. But this points over here, that would give you a lot of gain in the fairness metric without a lot of loss in satisfaction. So these are the areas which we are interested in, that I won't hurt user satisfaction that much, but I'll still gain a lot of artist level fairness metric. So this is the inflection point over here is of most interest to us, that how far can we go to the left without getting dip on the y-axis. In general, we saw that guaranteeing relevance improves satisfaction, but in general, it hurts fairness. That, I mean, once you guarantee relevance, then fairness is not uh, gained as such. And in general, adaptive policies are better than non-adaptive policies. And basically, adaptive policy allows you to get gains in fairness without severe losses in relevance. So that's kind of a mix, the best of both worlds. I have some, like, some fine-tuned results which I'm not gonna go through. But the summary over here is, I'm, I'm rushing through this because I want to spend more time on the second part, is that in general, trading off relevance and fairness for satisfaction is much better than just blindly optimizing for relevance. Because if you blindly optimize for relevance, in a marketplace, you're gonna do a very shitty job at exposing a lot of these long tail of suppliers. This is true for the specific case for Spotify right now, but then that should ideally be true for other e-commerce and marketplace settings as well. I like this takeaway from this user tolerance, that if you're able to quantify user tolerance, and that's like a very nice idea which you can play around with. We just experiment with one level of user tolerance, but imagine if you want to try some very fancy new model. And if you're doing an A-B test, so if you have this tolerance estimator for the user, what you can do is you can try out some very risky model to those users in like a, in like a more uh, favorable setting than exposing some like risky users to like some wild experimentation. So basically you can do a lot of like very good A-B test split ups around this uh, if you use the tolerance estimator in a nice way. And in general, there is benefit in considering objectives beyond just user satisfaction. And this is what motivates the need for doing this multi-stakeholder optimization uh, beyond just satisfaction. That in this small case study, we showed that if you're looking at relevance and one objective, which is fairness, then they're not aligned. Optimizing for one hurts the other. So you need to do a multi-objective, or you need to do kind of, I mean, these, these techniques we had over here, the list of techniques we had, uh, they were very simple models. It's very intuitive that you optimize for one or the other, or you do a trade-off analysis. But what if you have multiple objectives? Like you have multiple stakeholders. So the multiple stakeholders might look like that you have the platform itself is one stakeholder, that the platform like Airbnb or Uber, they would want to extract more money. You have the suppliers, which is the Uber drivers, the Spotify artists, they want more exposure. Then you also have deals with like, if you're working on this like Uber Eats space, like food delivery, 
and then you want you have tie ups with like these uh, delivery people as well so you want the drivers who are delivering food to you they you don't want to kill them as well you don't want one guy to deliver all the food you want a good enough exposure so that other people can earn money as well so there's a lot of different nuances around the business objectives you can have and the business stakeholders you can have in a marketplace and each of them would come up with their own objectives their own metrics so that's why there is a need to uh principally think about how do we do this in a principled machine learning way rather than just intuitively mixing and matching and combining these two things together so this is what the focus is of this part this is joint work with nyanan he is a phd student at imperial he is graduating in the next 6 to 8 months we are trying to recruit him and if you are interested you can kind of he's yeah he's one of the lead authors on this paper so you can try to hire him as well any questions before we proceed you were louder before <laughs> why don't you show beta equals 0 where you show just fair recommendations sorry i couldn't uh, in that graphs yep beta over trade right, off yeah. trade off why beta 0 is missing oh i think uh, is it missing you didn't want to lose any tables so beta 0 is oh, so beta 0 is only relevance right yeah uh, is it yeah i mean ah or is it on the fair I mean either of them but both are included over here right anyway Yeah but why one side is there and the other one I mean that's if that's true then that's like a genuine yeah. un- So here why does Ah oh, right here yeah. Oh that's just like a plotting error There's ah. no there's no deep uh, psychological or philosophical reason But is it not like where you just show the fair result and you don't want to lose any users No it's, so it's I No I mean uh, to be honest like we had all the results and I mean mathematically the results are there because <laughs> the zero beta equal to zero and beta equal to one are there as well okay. uh, on the table but it's just like a plotting thing which we well, that's a good point i mean I, i'll just include it and avoid this question any other question cool so so this is where uh, we go into some very recent work this is a paper which is on the review at ai sats we will know what it in like 5 days so yeah no prayers would help now because a decision would have been made so in general this is multi objective models for marketplaces and just a recap we have we've been talking about contextual bandits bart specifically and the idea is that you have a user preference model which says that for this playlist we have features for this user we have features would the user be happy with this playlist or not we have this arm selection strategy which is in a simple case epsilon greedy which says that from this set of candidate playlists with epsilon probability i'm going to explore with 1 minus epsilon probability i'm going to exploit and then you have a reward a simple reward could be that if i show you a playlist if you stream for more than 30 seconds i'm going to give you a plus 1 if not i'm going to give you a zero so this would compose the uh, the the contextual bandit model we we've kind of discussed in the previous talk but in general when we go from the single objective to a multi objective setting then things become tricky because so far we had worked with single objective now we have multiple objective so far we had worked with just one reward that because we are talking about user satisfaction so far so just one reward as to how satisfied the user is now we have this vectorial reward because if you have five stakeholders they would have five objectives so now you have this reward function which is not just a scalar value it's a vector of five values the closest related work to this work there's this icml paper last year around multi objective bandits and this is not a contextual bandit so this is not directly applicable to us so we have to kind of propose a new model to do this so what would what what, what does this work entail as such so we are working with a set of cards we have we've seen this before we have a set of cards each card is a playlist we try to show this playlist to user but instead of just a single objective we have multiple objectives over here some of it are user centric artist centric some spotify or platform economics and dot 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 so on and so forth and what you want to do is if you have a multi objective setting you have multiple stakeholders you want to quantify what this objective should be and then give back to the model and then let it do its magic so again if you have been sleeping before and if you're going to sleep again the one line summary of the work is that we use something called the generalized gini index so what it does is is like a ordered weighted averaging so you have multiple objectives 
for each objective, you have a weight. And what GGI does is, it kind of prefers equitable allocation across these metrics. So the idea, which I'm going to describe in detail, but there's this function, which is GGI. You can go back and look it up. What basically it does is, if, to, if you try to optimize for this function, it tries to balance the different objectives in an equal way. That if I have five objectives, and each of these five objectives will get like an equal, a fair chance of uh, improving in a, in a kind of an equitable fashion. So with this, I kind of go into the exact algorithmic details. So in general, what we do is like we want to design an ARM selection strategy. What is an ARM selection strategy? It's just saying that if I have a set of items, a set of playlists, which ARM should I pick? Which card should I pick and show to the user? So that's the ARM selection strategy we want to design. And basically, it's just a distribution, probability distribution based on, which, based on which ARM is selected. So if I have a set of like 200 cards, 200 playlists, then I, want, I have a distribution. And based on this probability distribution, I will pick up a playlist and show to the user. So that's the goal. Based on the multiple objectives we have, finally, we have to come up with this policy which tells me the probability of selecting an ARM. That's the goal which we are working with you here. What we do is, for each instance, we have a user coming into Spotify, we have a session. So for each session T, we have this user features, user and context features. We have the user ID, we have a lot of user demographic information, user interest profiles, and we have if the user will, is going to like the card or not. So we have a set of features in this current session. Now, what we do is that if we choose an ARM K, that means if I choose a playlist K, then we observe a linear reward. So this reward was, so far, it was just a 0 and 1. Is the user happy with this playlist or not? Now it's a vectorial reward based on how much gain the different objectives have. So what we do is we say that we, we kind of make an assumption that the reward is a linear function of this f with some parameters theta. So ideally, if, we, if I decide to pick a card 1, then I would observe the reward based on this function for this k equal to 1. Because we have a, a vectorial reward, then if I know for each card what the reward would be, then I would just do an, a kind of a full sweep and then pick pick the card which maximizes all the reward and then show it to the user all the time. So the thing is like this reward is not known. That's the main point over here, that I do not know how the user will react to this particular card, how the other metrics would behave for this card. If I know that this is how the metrics will behave, then all I have to do is like do a grid search, find the maximum, and then show it to the user. But the thing is like we do not know because each time we show a playlist, is context driven. I mean, you might have liked sleep music yesterday, but now you're in a party, of course you wouldn't like sleep music. So the reward which we have, we do not know that because it's heavily dependent on the context. So that's why we cannot do a full three, we cannot just do an arg max and pick the maximum, pick the top and show it. So that's why we need to kind of do this uh, optimization wherein we're trying to maximize this function, which is a G Gini index function. So if it looks complicated, then let's try to kind of break this down into manageable parts. So we have this theta parameter which says that, OK, this theta and f will give us the probability of the reward which we can obtain when we show this card to the user. This is the prior probability of showing this particular card to the user. This function g is the Gini index function. So basically, what we have is for all the cards we have, let's say we have k playlists and k cards. So for all the cards, we try to, and for all the objectives we have, we try to maximize this Gini objective function. And this Gini objective function was this. So basically what we're saying is that we are trying to optimize a function which prefers equitable preference across these uh, metrics. I'm happy to pause for 20 seconds, hoping that you would understand this. If not, I can explain it again. So basically, yep. Sorry, I just want to understand what is the f? So f, f over here is the set of features we have for the user. So, so basically, if a user comes to Spotify, then we have user interest vectors. So we have an embedding representation of what you might like. We also have this card. So we have 
your features, we have this playlist features, and then we have your interaction features that have you streamed something like this before or not. So F covers all these features for a given session. And if this looks complicated, then just, just forget about this. And imagine like if you're, if you're optimizing for just relevance, right? So what I would do is I have this set of candidate cards. My function would look like arg max over a relevance function that find the card, find the playlist, which gives us the maximum relevance for this user. So that's a very simple function which we saw before. Just maximum of a function of relevance, that's it. So we replace that function with this Gini index function. So what we are doing is we are replacing a function of just single objective by a function of multiple objectives. And this function is a specific function, which is a Gini index. I could have replaced it by any scalarized function. Like I could just kind of weigh my uh, objectives, combine them in a linear manner, and then replace it. So instead of doing that, I have this Gini index, which I'm trying to optimize. Uh, excuse me? So the Gini index kind of act like an expectation of, um, of the thing here, because we want to maximize the expectation result, something like that. Yes, so it, it does that in across objectives. So expect like basically in expectation, you would have equal weighted weightage to each objective. And so that's, yeah, that's the key difference, that the Gini index works with multiple objectives. The functions we have seen so far works with single objectives. And I could have replaced this Gini index by just a linear combination as well. But that may not have given me equitable preference to all the objectives. So it's just a very simple thing. I mean, if the thing is, I optimize just relevance. I optimize maybe a linear function combination of my objectives, or I optimize a Gini index combination of my objectives. And all we are saying is that a Gini index combination is more useful because inherently it allows us to do this equitable distribution. You had a question? Um, just to the formula itself. So I want to understand what are the um, uh, variables that um, parameters that is already uh, given to the uh, to the function, and what are the learnable parameters that we need right. to optimize for? Yeah. So, so the learnable parameters over here would be. I think I have this later. Yeah, I have this right in the next slide. So basically, the the what what is given is that all you all you have is like the user is coming to Spotify. So you have the user features. You have a set of cards, the playlist which you can show. So you have all the features for all the cards. And then you have the interaction features. So all we work is this interaction, this kind of feature set. And what you have access to is like, in the past, how have these metrics behaved? So, so this is the input data. You have a follow-up question? Um, is, the, the, is the data uh, also a uh, provided parameter or is something the model needs to learn from the data vector of uh, m, m, m by n uh, m by d dimension matrix is that is that also a uh, could you repeat that is the data also is, is the data uh, m by d uh, the dimension matrix is that a learnable parameter too or is something that has been um, no that's not that's not learning I mean basically the only thing learnable is the distribution across basically the distribution across these arms. Like for this user context, basically it's a contextual bandit, right? And a contextual bandit works in a context. The context here is a user and the session right now. And for this context, what should my arm selection strategy be? That is the parameter which we are trying to obtain. That's the first line over there. That's the goal. That for this user session, I want to know what arm to select. That's the parameters which we try to learn here. There were others, yeah. Do you hear me? Okay. So my question is about context. So how do you figure out which particular context are you optimizing for in each particular session for a user? So basically, like, the way we define context is, so context is effectively a set of features then. That you have, let's, the context features would look like the user features, the item features, and like day, day of the, day of the week, uh, time of the day, and stuff like that. So your context is essentially uh, feature space. And different users would have different values in that feature space. So your context right now, even for you, the context will differ between today and tomorrow, because your vectors remain the same. The playlist vectors remain the same. But the time of day and the day of the week, they changes. So if, we, if the context is these features, then these values change based on your parameters and based on like the, the global world parameters. 
Yeah, but if it's some kind of party, some kind of you know unusual yes. event, then how yes. do you plan yeah, for so, those? Yeah, so, so that's a very good point. I mean, we do want to be able to know that. That ideally, a contextual bandit would benefit from knowing more context. What we can do is we can try to predict where, what you're doing. We don't do that yet. I mean, at least not publicly. Uh, I mean, <laughs> by publicly, I mean like as per research, I'm not aware of if we do that or not. But basically, we, 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 right now, we do not have any GPS location. I mean, it's very easy to find out uh, about users if we know the GPS location, but right now, we don't have access to GPS coordinates on, on, the, on the Spotify app, which is good, because we're not invading your privacy. So you should go to Spotify if you're not using it already. But in general, yes, if you're able to predict your context, like we, it's very easy to predict if you're in office or not. Because you're, I mean, we know you're in commute because, I mean, the accelerometer tells you you're walking or you're running or stuff like that. So we can easily extract these insights to know when you're traveling, when you're on a tube. If the Wi-Fi goes away, it's a clear signal you're in London underground. You're not in New York because only London has this underground wherein we don't have internet. But so that's the thing. I mean, we can infer a lot of these contextual features, but there's a limit based on the data we have. And the contextual management model would ideally benefit a lot from knowing more context, but then the user would not be happy at providing more context. So it's a known problem. Yep. Yes, how do you choose the weights in the Gini function? Yeah, we don't. Uh, that's, so that's the thing. Because it prefers equitable distribution, so the weights are always uh, one upon the objectives you have. I'm, I'm going to, oh, I just have 10 minutes. Sure. Uh, so, I'm going to refer to that, that this is like a major drawback in the current setting. So the weights, which I, which I mentioned over here, is that right now, basically what happens is like when the model is trained over n number of sessions, then at each point of time, the weights are different. So what GGI does, it, it adjusts the weight to make sure that somebody, some objective which has suffered so far, it gets a bigger weight so that in the end, all objectives have equal weight. So basically, if you have objectives one, two, and three, and in the first few sessions you focus on objective one, then GGI would adjust the weights and make objective three a higher weight than others. So it does this like adjustment background. Effectively, at the end, you get the result, which is uh, equal weight is given in expectation over all sessions to each of the objectives. And that's a very major drawback, uh, which we are kind of currently working on. So there's like a follow-up research which needs to be done, which says that what if you want control over the objectives. What if you want to kind of uh, have define your weights as per your nuances? Because only 10 minutes are left, you're going to skip some of this, which I would have explained in great detail. But I'm skipping this because I want to show you some nice plots which the intern made. But I'm happy to talk about these later uh, if you're still awake after this talk. But in general, I mean, so we have this like multi-objective model, uh, multi-objective contextual model, contextual bandit model for multiple stakeholders, for multiple objectives. And the question is like, is it even going to work? So in general, uh, if you talk to an ICML or NIPS researcher, then they don't care much about, actually I take it back because it's being recorded. Uh, so they care more about theoretical guarantees. So a lot of previous work around these uh, Bandit models and conditional bandit models has focused on providing lower bounds on lower and upper bounds in performance. So theoretically, to answer this question, is it going to work? We have to do this regret bounds. So is the regret bounded? By regret, I mean like from the ideal scenario, how worse you are. So you have to have a lower bound so that you kind of don't do much worse than that. This is the slide which made you all came back. Uh, this is saying that, yeah, we, we did some we kind of derived using this, like some five other slides with this similar math. But basically, the overall regret is bounded. So empirically, practitioners don't care much about this. But then uh, we do have a bound which is not that great, but at least there is this bound. So there, there needs to be improvements around this bound. I'm not going to go into details for obvious reasons. But in general, like we do have a bound which needs to be improved. But this is where the exciting part comes in. We have like very exciting offline results. So in general, what we were doing was we were, now, now forget about all the math, just look, look at it from a user perspective, that we have users interacting with Spotify. We're working the Spotify homepage model. And we have some of these metrics like clicks. Do you click on a playlist or not? Is stream time, how much time do you stream from this playlist? 
Business streams like, uh, I shouldn't have mentioned this. <laughs> Let's just ignore this. I'm not going to define it uh, because I'm not supposed to. Total number of songs played. So we can, we can define any number of user-centric metrics. And what we do is, right now, we, we don't have any competing, any other uh, fairness or promotions, nothing, no business metric over here, everything about the user. And what we do is, like, optimizing for, I mean, one of the results we got was that optimizing for different metrics impacts other objectives, which means that if you want more clicks, you should optimize for clicks. But what we did see was that the multi-objective model performs way much better. And this is like very, very surprising, because what, what this says is that if I optimize a model only for clicks, that's not going to perform as well as if I optimize a model for these metrics together. And this, this difference in result is like, I mean, we kind of tested it a few times to make sure that this is correct and not like a, a production or some programming bug. But this is a, like a very, very good insight to have. And this, this slide itself is worth one research publication. Basically, what it says is that when you're trying to optimize for multiple metrics, they're not competing. So you're learning from different metrics as well. So if you only optimize for clicks, then you're only learning from click behavior of users. But if you're, learning, if you're optimizing all of them together, then there are other things which the other metrics are giving you. So that's like you're learning from more information when you're optimizing them jointly. There is this nice Rexis paper earlier this year which looks at chaining of metrics. Now, if you look at stream time, so stream time as a metric is conditioned on click. So you're going to stream only when you click. So there is this chaining across metrics happening. So if you want to kind of dig deeper into that, so there's this, look at this like chaining of metrics paper at Rexis. It talks about some of these, like how metrics are changed and chained and how they kind of impact the optimization routine. So this is like a super fancy good result for us as well, that instead of just optimizing for one thing, I optimize for multiple user things and it makes the model perform much better. And not just on one metric, it performs better on all the metrics. Like all the four metrics we see, like a much better improved performance from this multi-objective model. So now the takeaway over here is like optimizing for multiple interaction metrics performs better for each metric than directly optimizing for that specific metric. So the red here highlights that the yellow red, I mean I made all the colors so that you kind of emphasize enough that this is like a very cool results to have. Any questions? Why? Yeah, so, so. <laughs> so, I mean, I don't have like a scientific answer to that, but the initial intuition, I mean, this is something which we are investigating right now, which is that intuitively, at least I believe that the model is able to pick learnings from other metrics, which are not present in a single specific metrics. So when you're doing this like multiple metrics and they're not competing, they're all making idly towards user satisfaction. So the other metrics are capturing things which the other one metric is not. So there is this like shared learning happening across multiple metrics which might be benefiting. And to, to answer this scientifically, what I would do is, is something which I intend to do over the next few weeks is that you can try to relate, find the correlation between metrics, that some metrics are correlated, so there's not much improvement in learning over there. Then you can look at how these metrics are related to each other and then how the performance improves across these. Two, uh, two follow-up questions. So um, do you think there's a local, um, a local minima for when optimizing uh, individual metrics and then therefore mo optimizing for multiple metrics at the same time uh, help the model to find maybe closer to global minimum? The second is, um, uh, is there any shared, uh, shared representation of the features from the user? Shared and what? Shared, uh, shared uh, features from the user by ba ba benefiting from learning multiple tasks at the same time. So, so basically, the f to answer the first question, like uh, this local minima aspect is more probable in like competing objectives, the results which we're going to talk about later. But when you try, I mean, I don't have a scientific answer to that yet because we have not done those experiments. But I mean, if I had to just take a wild guess, then I believe that the local, op that's a good point actually, the local optima is more probable in the case when you have competing objectives, if all the objectives want, I mean, there's also this chaining effect that stream will only happen based on click. 
So for a stream to happen, click has to happen. So, so that means like the model is going, I mean, in, in the SGD gradient descent way, is going in that direction, but how far is going based on, is, is based on like the chaining effect across these metrics. So that's something which we are currently investigating. The other question I didn't understand, but I may not have the time right now, so I'll follow it up. So the other thing is like now we can add competing, competing objectives. So let's say we add a business objective, say gender exposure. So I, I, what I want to do is like I want to expose female artists equally well as well. So what we do, what we see is like basically the one line summary is like we see gains in business metrics, a statistically significant gain without hurting user-centric metrics. So we do see that in general you can optimize for business metrics as well you get a gain in business metrics and you do not lose much on the user-centric metrics. So effectively, all this says is it's not a zero-sum game. When you're talking about multiple stakeholders, a zero-sum game would mean that if one gains, the other loses. So this result highlights that perhaps, I mean, we are not sure because it's a very specific use case, perhaps we can get gains in the business objectives without loss in user-centric. So there is a maybe, I mean, there's a lot of ifs and perhaps and maybes here because we haven't delved deeper into this. But maybe there is this space wherein everybody benefits. And specifically, you have to take into account that this is music domain. And here, the domain itself allows you some flexibility. Like in search, if you don't show me like, like useful results, I don't care what business objectives you're achieving. But in music, even if you show me some shitty result, maybe I develop a taste for it. Maybe I, I'm happy to just kind of explore because I'm exposed to new music as well. So there are a lot of domain. I mean, there's a lot of confounding things going on over here. The domain may be giving us some of these results as well because music as a domain is more uh, lenient than like search, where you have to match the query as such. So with those caveats, the, the claim over here is that it may not be a zero-sum game. And in general, this is important as well, that just doing naive multi-optimization uh, doesn't work because we, we tried a bunch of different approaches and uh, in general, like um, basically, like we tried a bunch of different ways of doing this multi-objective optimization modeling, but the model we proposed was the only one which performed better. So naively, basically, naively doing multi-objective is not always rewarding. So how do you, how we do this multi-objective ML matters a lot as well. So that's the summary of uh, the the third phase, saying basically that optimizing for multiple metrics performs better without even considering any competing metrics. So this is like a very good thing to investigate even if you're not a marketplace. And if you're a marketplace, then it's not a zero-sum game, perhaps. And how we do this machine, the multi-objective ML matters, and if you want to do it the right way, then you should look up our paper. Oh, there's something else, I should. So, so this is like, to, to leave you with like some few research questions if you want to ex kind of explore later on, that, uh, so I don't recall making these slides, so I might read as well as you do, because I was in Singapore yesterday, so I'm suffering from jet lag as well. So machine learning for marketplaces goes a lot beyond multi-objective models. So, okay, this is so. So basically, as, uh, as you mentioned, that GGI right now promotes, like, uh, vouchers for equal weights across metrics. But as, as, as a system designer, I don't want that. I want to weigh more user satisfaction and weigh less some of the other business metrics. GGI right now does not allow me to do that. So that's why we need to kind of have differential weights in GGI. GGI is a Gini index function we had. So that part is like an open-ended question. There's no research paper right now which makes GGI uh, amenable to kind of uh, differential weights. In general, global optimization models. Uh, so basically, yeah, so, so, so far, we have been talking about a user session specific, that for this session, we want to be fair. For this session, we want to be relevant. But as such, you don't care about individual sessions. You care about the entire, let's say, a week-long period. For my A-B test, I was fair globally. So, not, so, so what that means is that you want to translate these models from a session-specific model to a global model. So let's say you have some global parameters, global variables, which define how fair you have been this month. So ideally, I want to be fair at the end of one month rather than being fair for each session, because that allows you more flexibility to kind of adjust and get gains in other metrics. So yeah, so we care about overall exposure for artists and not per session exposure as such. Something happened? No? Oops. 
So, I, I mean, there are quite a few open research questions around user tolerance, because right now, the user tolerance we have is like one value for a user, but this value could be used context dependent. Like, if I'm, I mean, if I'm listening music on when I'm working, then if you show me some shitty songs, then I don't care. But if I'm with my friends, they are listening to the music I'm playing, and if you show me a shitty song, then that kind of tarnishes my image. So it's very context different. Some users are tolerant, some users are not, but it's also based on the context and the feature as well. Now, quantifying business objectives is a lot harder than it looks. I mean, in the past six months, we've been trying to talk with some of the creator, uh, by creator we mean some of the artist specific teams at Spotify, trying to ask them to quantify their objectives. And it's not trivial to quantify these objectives. An example would be we discuss on fairness, that it's not at all easy to define one definition of fairness. Because if you define one definition, 100 other people are going to find out loopholes in that definition. So in general, quantifying fairness, quantifying the revenue metrics, quantifying the campaign objectives, these are very much needed if you want gains. And this multi-objective model heavily relies on these. So you have to quantify these in a scientific way. And in general, right now, uh, we don't have any constraints right now. So in, in, the, in the previous, uh, in the first part of this talk, we did mention like guaranteeing relevance. So we can put a constraint that, oh, the relevance should be greater than 0.8. But right now, this model does not take into account any constraints. But it would be nice to have some guardrail metrics. By guardrail metrics, I mean that in the worst case, I don't want the user to get exposed to shitty recommendations for like the entire week. So you can have these kind of guardrail metrics which you dare not uh, kind of fail. So you can have these guardrail metrics. You can impose these guardrail metrics as constraints. But right now, the model is not doing those constraint things as well. So these are uh, the different questions. This is what, something very interesting as well for Spotify, and in general as well, that different touch points offer different bandwidths. The reason why I'm saying this is like, if you're on a home page, then users come to the home page to kind of consume recommendations. Now contrast this with search. If I'm on the search page, then I know what I'm looking for. That's why I'm formulating my query. So you have limited bandwidth to do this marketplace and multi-objective thing in search. Because in search, the domain is that the user knows what he's looking for. So the default bandwidth of what all you can push, what all different recommendations you can serve, is limited in search versus home. On home, the user has no query. I mean, the user, we can show any. I mean, we did that for Drake. Unfortunately, the entire Spotify was taken over by Drake uh, when he launched the Scorpion. Uh, I'm, Again, it's being recorded, so I cannot officially state my opinion on that. But then like some users are not happy, of course, with, with that. So what you want is like you want to be able to quantify the bandwidth which each touch point offers. Like a radio would offer different things, search would offer different things, a recommendation would offer different things. So different features offer different bandwidths to do this multi-objective marketplace machine learning work. So that can be quantified, that could be investigated in detail. So that's it. Uh, Brief summary, thinking about marketplaces using multi-objective methods. We kind of develop a computational framework to understand the interplay between relevance and fairness. And we were kind of working into looking into multi-objective bandits. I'm going to come back to this slide because uh, I stole this slide from one of my colleagues. We do have research scientists, research engineers, data scientist positions open at Spotify in London, in New York, Boston, and Stockholm. So we are based, the headquarters, the mothership is in Stockholm, but yeah, we have like, and that's why I've kept these two open, like the job category and the location is like pretty flexible. And we do offer like a lot of these, like, so the kind of roles we have is like data engineers, we have backend engineers, we have machine learning engineers. So a lot of variety in engineering roles based on what kind of research or what kind of work you want to do. In terms of research, we have data scientists, we have machine learning scientists, we have audio research scientists as well. So again, flexibility around uh, what kind of work uh, you want to do. And I mentioned this before, so I'm not going to repeat these. But yeah, thank you.